Welcome to the Tech Think Tank, where we bring you the latest insights and ideas on technology. We are kicking off the series on Amazon Web Services with this video. As part of this series of videos, we will explore different components of Amazon Web Services AWS, one of the most popular cloud platforms. This series of videos will help you to learn the necessary skills to prepare for the AWS Solutions Architect Professional Certification. As businesses and organizations continue to move towards the cloud, AWS has emerged as a go-to solution for many companies due to its scalability, flexibility, and cost-effectiveness. However, with so many different services and tools available within AWS, it can be overwhelming to know where to start. That's where we come in, we're here to keep you informed about the latest technology and how it can impact your daily life. So sit back, grab a cup of coffee, and let's dive in. Today we're delving into the world of AWS identity and access management. As technology continues to evolve, it's important to stay informed and up-to-date. In this video, we'll explore AWS Identity and Access Management IAM, a critical security service within AWS. IAM is likely the first security service you'll encounter, as it enables you to configure specific access controls within your environment. We'll cover all the features and elements of IAM including 1. What is IAM and why it's necessary to implement and maintain control of the service. 2. Groups, users, and roles, and how each is typically used. 3. IAM policies, how to create, modify, and apply them within your AWS environment. 4. Multi-factor authentication, MFA, and its best practices. 5. Identity federation, which allows you to access AWS resources using identities outside of the IAM service. 6. IAM features, including IAM account settings, credential reports, and integration with KMS, the key management service. By the end of this video, you'll be able to set up and configure users, groups, and roles to control authorization for accessing specific resources. You'll be able to implement MFA, create and implement IAM policies, and restrict very granular and specific permissions across a range of resources. You'll understand when and why you may use Identity Federation access and how KMS is used with IAM. Although I'll explain everything from the ground up, having some basic experience with AWS and awareness of other services may be helpful. However, it's not essential. So buckle up and get ready to learn about one of the most powerful cloud platforms in the world. Let's dive into AWS. Let's deep dive to the overview of what the Identity and Access Management Service is and what IAM actually means. Firstly, let's learn what is meant by Identity and Access Management. Identities such as AWS usernames are required to authenticate to your AWS account. Authentication is the process of presenting an identity, in this case, a username, and providing verification of the identity such as entering the correct password associated. The second part, access management, relates to authorization and access control. Authorization determines what an identity can access within your AWS account once it's been authenticated to it. An example of this authorization would be the identity's list of permissions to access specific AWS resources. Access control can be classed as a mechanism of accessing a secured resource. For example, a username and password, multi-factor authentication, MFA, or federated access. MFA and federated access will all be explained in greater detail as we go through the rest of the video. So essentially IAM can be defined by its ability to manage, control and govern authentication, authorization, and access control mechanisms of identities to your resources within your AWS account. Now we know what IAM relates to, let me explain what the service actually does. As I just explained, the AWS IAM service is used to centrally manage and control security permissions for any identity requiring access to your AWS account and its resources. This is achieved by using different features within IAM consisting of 1. Users. These are objects within IAM identifying different users. 2. Groups. 
these are objects that contain multiple users. 3. Roles, these are objects that different identities can adopt to assume a new set of permissions. 4. Policy permissions, these are JSON policies that define what resources can and can't be accessed. 5. And access control mechanisms, these are mechanisms that govern how a resource is accessed. Each of these features will be discussed in detail as I take you through the video. Let's dive into the basics of identity and access management, IAM, and its meaning. IAM is crucial in authenticating AWS usernames and verifying their identities by providing the correct password. Access management is the next step, encompassing authorization and control. Authorization determines the extent of an identity's access to resources in your AWS account, while access control safeguards secured resources through mechanisms like MFA and federated access. IAM manages, controls, and governs authentication, authorization, and access control mechanisms for your AWS account resources. The AWS IAM service centrally manages and controls security permissions for all identities that require access to your AWS account and its resources. IAM utilizes several features, including users, groups, roles, policy permissions, and access control mechanisms to achieve this. Users are IAM objects that identify different users, groups are objects that contain multiple users, and roles allow different identities to adopt a new set of permissions. Policy permissions define the resources that can and cannot be accessed, while access control mechanisms dictate how resources are accessed. And access control mechanisms govern how a resource is accessed. Join me as I delve into each of these features in greater detail throughout the video. In AWS, some services are regional while others are global. IAM is a global service, which means you don't need to create separate users or groups for each AWS region where you have resources. IAM covers all regions and is the first service users interact with when using AWS. This is because identities need to be authenticated by IAM before accessing any AWS resource, either through the AWS Management Console or the AWS Command Line interface using an API call. Understanding how IAM works and what it can achieve is critical, but implementing its features is even more important. Without IAM, there would be no way to maintain security or control over who or what accesses your resources, both internally and externally. IAM provides the components to maintain access management, but it's only as strong and secure as your configuration. It's up to you, as the owner of the AWS account, to define how secure your access control procedures should be, how much to restrict users from accessing certain resources, how complex your password policy should be, and whether to require multi-factor authentication. All of this and more depends on your own security standards and policies within your information security management systems. You can access the IAM service from the AWS Management Console under the security identity and compliance category. If you have the necessary permissions, you can administer all security from an IAM perspective on the IAM dashboard. The IAM dashboard displays information related to the IAM sign-in link, which is a URL link that you can customize to make it easier for users to remember and read. This customization is particularly helpful if you have multiple AWS accounts. The dashboard also provides an overview of your IAM resources, including the number of users, groups, roles, customer managed policies, and identity providers you have configured. Additionally, the security status section offers five best practices from a security perspective that AWS IAM recommends you implement, such as activating MFA on your root account, creating individual IAM users, using groups to assign permissions, applying an IAM password policy, and rotating your access keys. Implementing these best practices helps maintain tight security when working with an IAM solution. In the next part of this video, we'll explore users, groups, and roles and their roles within IAM.
Here I am going to explain the distinctions between user, group, and role objects in AWS IAM. Let's start with users. Users are used to represent an identity, which could be a person in your organization requiring access to operate and maintain your AWS environment or an account used by an application that needs permission to access your AWS resources programmatically. They are objects representing identity used in the authentication process to your AWS account. When creating a new user, you can choose to create it via the AWS Management Console, programmatically through the AWS CLI, Tools for Windows PowerShell, or using the IAM HTTP API. In this article, I will demonstrate how to configure various elements of AWS IAM using the AWS Management Console. Creating a user involves seven steps, including setting user details, selecting the AWS access type, defining a password if necessary, assigning permissions, and reviewing and confirming information. After creating the user, you can download the security credentials within a CSV file containing the username, keys required for programmatic access, and the console login link. You can also email these details to the new user. Access keys are required for programmatic access for authentication and are made up of an access key ID and a secret access key ID. The access key ID is comprised of 20 random uppercase alphanumeric characters, while the secret access key ID is made up of 40 random upper and lowercase alphanumeric and non-alphanumeric characters. You should save these keys upon creation as AWS does not retain copies, and losing them will require you to delete the associated access key ID and recreate new keys for the user. To ensure that all API requests made to AWS are signed with this digital signature, the access keys must be associated with the application you are using that requires the relevant access. Once your user identity is created, you can view a summary of the object by selecting the user from within the user page of the console. In addition to managing access keys and passwords, you can manage multi-factor authentication, signing certificates, SSH public keys for AWS code commit, and HTTPS Git credentials for AWS code commit. Code commit is a managed source control service that allows you to host secure and scalable private Git repositories. Finally, it's worth noting that permission assignments can either be assigned to the user or inherited from being a member of a group. Assigning permission to individual users should be avoided and it's best practice to use groups for permission assignment. So let's now take a look at groups to help explain why. Let's take a closer look at IAM groups and how they work to authorize access to AWS resources. IAM groups are similar to user objects but they are not used in the authentication process. Instead, they are used to grant access to AWS resources through AWS policies. IAM groups contain IAM users, and these groups have associated IAM policies that allow or deny access to AWS resources. There are two types of IAM policies, AWS managed policies, which are pre-configured policies available within IAM, and customer managed policies, which you create. A lecture devoted to IAM policies will provide more information on this element. Groups are typically created to meet a specific requirement or job role, and users who are members of a group inherit the group's permissions. By applying permissions to a group instead of individual users, it is easier to modify permissions for multiple users at once. Modifying a group's permissions updates the access for all associated users, avoiding the need to update permissions for each user individually. This is especially important in enterprise environments, where assigning permissions to groups is considered a best practice. Creating a group is a simple three-step process. Firstly, you need to give your group a meaningful name. Next, you assign permissions via policies, and finally, you review the group before creating it. Once the group is created, you can assign users to the group. It's important to note that AWS accounts have a default maximum limit of 100 groups. If you need to increase this limit, you will need to contact AWS using the appropriate limit increase forms. Also, each user can only be associated with up to 10 groups, so keep this in mind when assigning permissions. In addition to users and groups, there's another important concept in AWS called IAM roles. These roles enable users, as well as other AWS services and applications, 
to temporarily adopt a set of IAM permissions to access AWS resources, which is essential for maintaining security best practices. Let's consider an example of how Amazon EC2 uses IAM roles. Say you have an EC2 instance running an application that needs to access Amazon S3 to perform put and get operations using the relevant API calls. You could store a set of credentials on the EC2 instance itself to allow access to S3, but this approach would require you to manage the credentials manually, including the rotation of access keys, which can be an administrative burden. To simplify this process, you can assign an IAM role to the EC2 instance. This role would contain the necessary permissions for the EC2 instance and its applications to access S3 and perform the required put and get API calls. You can assign a role to an EC2 instance during instance creation or after it's up and running. You can also replace an existing role with a different one if needed. It's important to note that IAM roles don't have any access keys or credentials associated with them. When the roles are used, AWS dynamically assigns the credentials required for accessing the resources. This approach has many advantages such as the ability to easily modify permissions associated with a role. For instance, if you have multiple EC2 instances performing the same task and using the same role, you can easily modify the permissions assigned to the role to restrict access to certain resources. IAM roles can also be used with IAM users. In some cases, you may need to grant temporary access to AWS resources to a particular user. Instead of giving the user their own permissions or adopting their group permissions, which isn't the best practice, you can simply allow them to assume a role, which temporarily replaces their existing permissions. To do this, you'll need to give the user permission to assume the role through an access policy. In summary, IAM roles play a critical role in maintaining security best practices in AWS. They enable users and applications to adopt temporary permissions to access resources and simplify the management of access credentials. There are currently four distinct types of roles that can be created, each serving a unique purpose. Firstly, the AWS service role is used by other services to perform specific functions based on a set of permissions associated with it. Some examples of AWS service roles include Amazon EC2, AWS Directory Services, and AWS Lambda. After selecting your service role, you will need to attach a policy with the required permissions and set a role name to complete its creation. Secondly, the AWS Service Linked role is a very specific role associated with certain AWS services. These roles are predefined by AWS and their permissions cannot be altered as they are set to perform a specific function. Examples of these roles include Amazon LexBots and Amazon Lex Channels. To create a service linked role, Simply assign it a name and complete the creation process. Remember, you cannot modify the permissions assigned to these roles. Thirdly, roles for cross-account access offer two options, providing access between AWS accounts that you own and providing access between an account that you own and a third-party AWS account. Access is managed by policies that establish trusting and trusted accounts that explicitly allow a trusted principal to access specific resources. Many services use roles to allow cross-account access to resources. At a high level, these roles are configured as follows. 1. The trusting account has the resources that need to be accessed. 2. The trusted account contains the users that need to access the resources in the trusted account. 3. A role is created in the trusting account. 4. A trust is then established with the role by entering the AWS account number of the trusted account. 5. Permissions are then applied to the role via policies. 6. The group of users in the trusted account then needs to have permission to assume the role in the trusted account. These groups of users would have a policy attached to the group, which would look something like the following, where the red text would be modified appropriately with the relevant information. Lastly, the role of identity provider access offers three different options. The first option is to grant access to web identity providers which is used to create trust for users using Amazon Cognito, Amazon, Facebook, Google, or any other OpenID Connect provider. The second option is to grant web single sign-on to SAML providers, 
allowing access for users coming from a SAML provider, security assertion markup language. The third option is to grant API access to SAML providers, similar to the second option, but allowing access via the AWS CLI, SDKs, or API calls. For these options, a trust relationship is set up between the external identity providers to allow access to your AWS account's resources, using their existing identity provider login information. More on Identity Federation will be covered in greater depth later in this video. In this section, we will explore IAM policies and their creation, modification, and construction. Additionally, we will review the syntax and structure of these policies. As previously mentioned, IAM policies assign permissions to users, groups, and roles. These policies are formatted as JSON documents, which follow a JavaScript object notation. Each policy must include at least one statement, which contains various sub-elements, including SID, action, effect, resource, and condition. These elements determine the level of access granted or denied to specific resources. Let's take a closer look at each of these elements. The SID, or statement ID, is a unique identifier within the statement array. As you add more permissions, you will have multiple SIDS within the statement. The action element specifies the action that will be allowed or denied, depending on the value entered for the effect element. Actions are essentially API calls for different services. Each service has its own set of actions, and the action is prefixed with the associated AWS service. For example, the delete bucket action is available for S3 but not for EC2, while the create key pair action is available for EC2 but not S3. The effect element can be set to either allow or deny, which grants or restricts access to the previously defined actions. By default, access to resources is denied. Therefore, if effect is set to allow, it replaces the default deny, and if set to deny, it overrides any previous allow. The resource element specifies the actual resource to which the action and effect should be applied. AWS uses unique identifiers known as Amazon Resource Names, ANS, to specify specific resources. ANS typically follow a syntax of partition, service, region, account ID, and resource. However, not all services require all of these components to be specified. The condition element is an optional element that allows you to control when the permissions will be effective based on set criteria. The element itself is made up of a condition and a key value pair. All elements of the condition must be met for the permissions to be effective. For example, you can specify an IP address as the condition and the key value pair to be effective against is the AWS source IP. If the source IP address of the user who is using the policy is within their 10.10.0.0 slash 16 network range, then the permissions will be allowed. For an IAM policy to grant permissions, all elements of the condition must be met. In the example we're looking at, the condition is the user's IP address. This is defined in the policy as an AWS source IP key value pair. Specifically, the policy allows access if the user's source IP address falls within the 10.10.0.0 slash 16 range. A single policy statement can have multiple SIDS, each granting a different level of access. In the example, we see three SIDS, each with a different color to indicate its scope. The first SID allows full access to the CloudTrail resource, but only if the user's IP address is within the specified range. The second SID grants full access to the autoscaling resource with no IP address restriction. The third SID allows the creation and deletion of S3 buckets within a specific IAM core CA bucket. Most IAM policies include these elements, but others can be added as needed. A complete list can be found here. There are two types of IAM policies, managed policies and inline policies. Managed policies come in two flavors. AWS Managed Policies and Customer Managed Policies. These policies can be assigned to groups, roles, or users, but it's best practice to use groups. AWS Managed Policies are pre-configured by AWS and cover common permissions. There are two AWS Managed Policies that cover S3, 
with one allowing read-only access and the other granting full access. These policies can be edited before being saved as a customer-managed policy. Customer-managed policies are any IAM policies that aren't predefined by AWS. They are useful when an AWS-managed policy is almost what you need, but requires some customization. For example, if you need read-only access to S3, plus the ability to create new buckets, you could start with the AWS-managed Amazon's 3 read-only access policy and add the create bucket permission. This results in a new customer-managed policy. There are a number of ways to create a customer-managed policy. These being the following. 1. Copy an AWS-managed policy. This is what we just covered, where an existing AWS-managed policy is used and then edited to create a new customer-managed policy. 2. The policy generator. This allows you to create a customer-managed policy by selecting options from a series of drop-down boxes. 3. You can create your own policy. If you are proficient in JSON and the syntax of IAM policy writing, then you can create your own policies from scratch or paste into a JSON policy from another source. This concludes our discussion of IAM policies. In the next section, I will give you an overview of multi-factor authentication, or MFA. In this section, we will discuss the access control method of MFA or multi-factor authentication. Typically, when a user logs into the AWS Management Console, they authenticate to their AWS account by providing their identification, such as their username, and verifying it with a password. These two elements, identification and verification, allow the user to authenticate. In many cases, the password verification is sufficient to confirm the user's identity. However, for users who have a high level of authorization and access to a large number of AWS services, additional verification steps may be required due to governance controls. This is where multi-factor authentication, or MFA, comes in. MFA adds another layer of security to the authentication process, attaching an additional factor to the user's identity. It creates a multi-factor level of authentication by adding an extra level of security to the existing methods, such as a password. MFA uses a random six-digit number that is only available for a short period of time before it changes again, generated by an MFA device. There is no additional charge for MFA, but you will need your own MFA device, which can be a physical token or a virtual device. AWS provides a summary of all supported devices, please refer to the link provided in the description. Personally, I use Google Authenticator on my phone because it is simple and easy to set up and configure. Before a user can authenticate with MFA, it must be configured and associated with the user. As a part of the authentication process, we need to ensure that the verification element confirms the identity of the user. This configuration and association can be done from within the IAM console. MFA can also be used to increase security when making API calls to other resources. For example, if you are creating a cross-account role between AWS accounts, you have the option during the creation of the trust to enforce MFA authentication to assume the role. That concludes our discussion of MFA. In the next section, we will discuss Identity Federation. In this section, we will discuss Identity Federation, including its definition, available types of federation, and how to create identity providers within IAM. Identity Federation enables access and management of AWS resources even without a user account within IAM. By using Identity Federation, users from external identity providers can securely access AWS resources without supplying AWS user credentials from a valid IAM user account. For instance, an identity provider can be a corporate Microsoft Active Directory. Federated access allows users within it to access AWS. Additionally, other forms of identity providers can be any OpenID Connect OIDC, web provider such as Facebook, Google, and Amazon. For more information on OpenID Connect, 
click the pop-up banner now or the link in the description below. Using existing accounts as an identity provider minimizes the administration required within IAM and enables a single sign-on solution. Since most organizations use Microsoft Active Directory, utilizing MSAD is an effective way of granting access to AWS resources without creating potentially hundreds of IAM user accounts. As a part of the configuration process to implement federated authentication, a trust relationship between the identity provider and your AWS account should be established. AWS supports two types of identity providers, OpenID Connect and SAML2. OpenID Connect allows authentication between AWS resources and any public OpenID Connect provider such as Facebook, Google, or Amazon. When an access request is made by a user to an AWS resource, the identity provider credentials will be used to exchange an authentication token for temporary authentication credentials. These temporary credentials with pre-configured permissions allow authorized access to the resource as required. To manage this process more efficiently, Amazon Cognito can be utilized, which helps manage users sign in to mobile and web apps through federated access. For more information on Amazon Cognito, please see the link provided in the description. SAML2 base federations enable existing Active Directory users to authenticate to AWS resources, allowing for a single sign-on solution. SAML stands for Security Assertion Markup Language and enables the exchange of security data, including authentication and authorization tokens between an identity provider and a service provider. In this case, the identity provider is a Microsoft Active Directory service, and the service provider is AWS. Once configured, this Active Directory authentication mechanism is established. This example assumes that a user within an organization requires API access to S3, EC2, and RDS. This scenario also includes the use of an AWS service called Security Token Service (STS). The Security Token Service enables the acquisition of temporary security credentials for federated users via IAM associated with IAM roles and policies. For more information on STS, please refer to the link provided in the description. An internal user initiates an authentication request to the Active Directory Federated Service ADFS, server using a single sign-on URL through a web browser. If their Active Directory credentials are successfully authenticated, SAML issues a successful authentication assertion back to the user's client requesting federated access. The SAML assertion is then sent to the AWS Security Token Service STS, to assume a role within IAM using the Assume Role with SAML API. You can find more information on this API through the link provided in the description. STS then responds to the user requesting federated access with temporary security credentials with an assumed role and associated permissions, allowing access to S3, EC2, and RDS, as per our example. The user now has federated access to the necessary AWS services as per the role permissions. This is a basic overview of how federation is initiated by a user for API access to specific AWS services. Corporate Identity Federation is always authenticated internally first by Active Directory before AWS. To use federation within IAM, you must first create an identity provider, which is a simple process if you have the correct information from your chosen identity provider. For OIDC providers, you will need a client ID, also known as an audience, that you will receive once you register your application with your identity provider. This ID is usually a unique identifier. You must also obtain a thumbprint to verify the certificate of your identity provider. For SAML providers, you will need a SAML metadata document that you can get from your identity management software from your identity provider. This document will include information such as the issuer's name, expiration date, and security keys, which are used to validate the SAML authentication response from your identity provider. More information on these requirements can be found in the IAM user guide. Please refer to the link provided in the description. To create an identity provider for OIDC, follow these steps. 1. From within the IAM console, select Identity Providers. 2. Click Create Provider. 3. Select OpenID Connect, enter the URL of the identity provider, 
enter the client ID, known as the audience, of your application that will communicate with AWS, discussed earlier, and provide the thumbprint for service certificate verification. 4. Create a role for the identity provider, verify the information, and click, create, and the OIDC provider will be created. To create a SAML provider, the process is slightly different. 1. From within the IM console, select, identity providers. 2. Click, create provider. 3. Select, SAML, enter a name for the identity provider, point to the SAML metadata document discussed earlier, verify the information, and click, create. This concludes the discussion on federation. In the next section, we will discuss a few other features of IAM. In this section, I will discuss some of the features of AWS Identity and Access Management IAM. Firstly, I will provide an overview of the IAM account settings, including the credential report, and then I will discuss the integration of key management service, KMS, within IAM. Let's start with the account settings. You can find these settings in the menu bar of the IAM console. The account settings provide information on your IAM password policy and security token service regions. The password policy can be customized to align with your security controls and standards to ensure compliance. For example, you can set a minimum length of 10 characters with a combination of uppercase and lowercase letters, numbers, and prevent the reuse of previous passwords. Once you have customized your password policy, you must apply it to activate it. The security token service regions at the bottom of the screen allow you to activate or deactivate regions for added security. By default, all regions are activated, but you can deactivate regions as needed. Moving on to the credential report, this report can be accessed from the IAM menu bar. The report contains a list of all IAM users and their credentials and can be downloaded as a CSV file. It's worth noting that the report is generated only once every four hours. The credential report can be useful for auditing your security services, ensuring that specific standards are being met, such as access key rotation or the use of multi-factor authentication MFA. The report can also be provided to external auditors to show evidence of compliance. Lastly, let's talk about KMS integration with IAM. KMS is a managed service by AWS that allows you to easily manage encryption keys to secure your data. IAM enables you to create and manage your KMS Customer Master Keys CMKs, from within your console. The CMKs are primarily used to protect data keys, which encrypt your data within AWS. You can create, view, and manage your CMKs from the Encryption Keys option within the IAM side menu bar. It's essential to administer your keys and how they are used to secure your data, as once lost or deleted, they cannot be recovered. Finally, let me summarize the key points we have covered so far. By now, you should have a good understanding of what the Identity and Access Management IAM, service is, what it does, and how its different components work together to secure access to your AWS resources. We began by exploring the concept of IAM and its close relationship with authentication, authorization, and access control. We then delved into the different components of the service, starting with users, groups, and roles. Just to recap, 1. Users are objects that represent identities used in the authentication process for your AWS account, such as individuals or applications. 2. Groups, on the other hand, are used to authorize access to AWS resources through the use of policies. They contain users and have policies associated with them that grant or deny access to resources. 3. IAM roles allow users of AWS services and applications to adopt a set of temporary IAM permissions to access AWS resources, ensuring compliance with security best practices. We then went on to discuss IAM policies, which are formatted as JSON documents and consist of at least one statement with a structure similar to the example below. IAM policies play a crucial role in determining which resources users, groups, and roles can access. Overall, a strong understanding of IAM and its components is essential for securing your AWS resources and protecting against potential security breaches. Moving on, we discussed two types of policies, AWS-managed policies and customer-managed policies. 
AWS managed policies are pre-configured IAM policies that can be assigned as required. On the other hand, customer managed policies can be created and modified by the customer. We then examined multi-factor authentication, MFA, which adds another layer of security to the authentication process. This verification method requires more than just a password to confirm the identity. For users with higher levels of authorization, MFA should be associated with their accounts. A physical or virtual device generates a random six-digit number for a short period, which has to be entered as part of the authentication process. Next, we looked at federation as a single sign-on approach. Identity federation enables users from external identity providers to access AWS resources securely without supplying AWS user credentials from a valid IAM user account. To implement federated authentication, a trust relationship between the identity provider and the AWS account must be established. AWS supports two types of identity providers, OpenID Connect, OIDC, and Security Assertion Markup Language, SAML, 2. OIDC enables authentication between AWS resources and any public OpenID Connect provider, while SAML 2-based federations enable existing Active Directory users to authenticate to AWS resources. Finally, we briefly covered some other features of AWS, such as creating a password policy for users within IAM and how this policy can be configured to reflect internal security standards. We also provided a high-level overview of how KMS customer master keys can be created from within the IAM console. Thank you for watching this video on AWS Identity and Access Management IAM, brought to you by the Tech Think Tank. We hope you found this tutorial informative and helpful in understanding how to securely manage access to your AWS resources. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below and we'll do our best to answer them. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more tech tutorials and insights. In addition, this is an experiment of less animation and more content-based videos. Please let me know if you like this type of video or if you would like more animation like my other videos. Thanks again for tuning in and we'll see you in the next video. Until next time, stay curious and keep on thinking.